Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, my topic was uh, screening, and as you know, the new guidelines, the new CDA guidelines, came out about a month and a half ago or so. Um, the screening has become a little more challenging, but screening has always been a bit of a difficult topic. So, and I've tried to make it easy, but it's very difficult to make something easy when the flowchart, uh, you know, basically has m many, many, many different components. Uh, and the grade of evidence is about grade D. So, you know, you understand that there's a bit of a challenge here, but we're going we're gonna to try to get through it anyway. Um, this particular slide set, most of it, although I've thrown in some of my own slides, most of it was developed by an expert committee, a CDA committee, and you can see the members of the committee here. That's from across Canada. And this illustrates the prevalence of diabetes. Now, this is 2009 uh, data, but uh, illustrates the prevalence of diabetes across the country, and you can see that uh, the prevalence varies depending on the province. Uh, BC happens to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, Ontario and uh, Newfoundland are kind of at the top end at, at over 6% or around 6%. And then um, Nunavut and Alberta appear to be at the lower end, although I must say that uh, some of these statistics, it's hard to know exactly that they were all gathered in the same way and, uh, and whether it's, uh, it's, it's statistically um, sort of similar across the provinces. So we'll go through a screening checklist. This is just sort of a general guide as to what's recommended for diabetes. And you can see that, that currently the CDA is, is recommending assessing all adults over the age of, well, all adults, period, uh, every year for the risk of type 2 diabetes. And you do this by doing a, a risk calculator, like, using, like a lot of other areas. Um, for those who are considered high risk or over the age of 40, it's recommended that you screen using one of the recommended screening tests uh, every three years, or screen earlier and more frequently if they're considered at very high risk based on their risk calculator score. And we're going to go through the risk calculator in a second. You can use fasting plasma glucose and or A1C as the initial screening test. So A1C, of course, has been fully sort of recognized and validated as a screening test and a diagnostic test for diabetes. Uh, this is evidence from the DIASCAN study. This was a Canadian study published in 2001 in Diabetes Care. And basically what it was is a survey of family physicians' offices across Canada. Uh, and uh, the, the survey was um, risk assessment in their patients and uh, over a period of time. And you can see that in this particular survey, and it's supposed to reflect, by the way, the... Um, the urban and rural breakdown of Canada. And you can see that in this survey, 78% uh, of the patients uh, in this study were normal, 16% had known diabetes. By the way, 16% is significantly higher than the estimated prevalence of diabetes in the population. So you can imagine that this did have some kind of selection bias. Um, probable diabetes was in 0.4%, impaired glucose tolerance in 0.6%, uh, impaired fasting glucose 2.5, and new diagnosis of diabetes based on these screening tests uh, were uh, found in 2.2% of patients for a total of 5.7% of undiagnosed glucose abnormalities. So now, again, there was a bit of a selection bias. This is family doctors who had patients with diabetes, and so you can imagine that perhaps there might have been an increased incidence of diabetes or undiagnosed diabetes in, in their practices. But um, it does reflect this idea that we are missing some cases of uh, diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance. Now, um, when it comes to actually looking at the impact of screening on outcomes in diabetes, the evidence is actually quite limited. Um, we don't have a lot of good studies. In fact, I would argue we don't have really any good studies that looked at the ultimate outcome of screening for diabetes in uh, either average risk or high risk populations. And this is the only really decent study that I think has been done, but it has real flaws. Um, it was done in the UK uh, in a series of family practice offices in, the Eastern, uh, in Eastern Britain. And what they did was that they uh, 
validated that uh, these family doctors had a certain number of diabetes patients and they were able to assess their records for certain criteria, high risk criteria. And then based on those risk criteria, they invited uh, people who were considered at high risk to come in and get screening tests done. The screening tests included a capillary glucose, uh, fasting glucose, an A1C, and a two-hour OGTT. And then they categorized these people according to whether they had diabetes or no diabetes. And then they went on to randomize them into a so-called intensive glycemic control arm versus a standard glycemic control arm versus a control group that was not screened at all. In other words, they were just followed over time, but they didn't have any screening, they didn't have any assessment or anything. And they looked at 10-year mortality data based on NHS records, right? So they have the NHS, they can do this kind of thing. Uh, much more difficult in other countries. Um, and you can see the results. There was no statistical difference at 10 years um, in overall mortality, and that included cardiovascular mortality. These are very hard endpoints. Cardiovascular mortality, uh, diabetes-related mortality or overall mortality, or cancer-related mortality in the two groups, that is, the people who had no screening versus the people who had screening. So when you see this kind of data, it's a little bit disheartening, and you think, well, what's the point um, if we don't really see a, an outcome difference? The problem with this is several fold. One is that the rate of diabetes that was seen in this particular study was about 3 to 3.3 percent. Now that's substantially lower than most uh, studies of the prevalence of diabetes in most Western countries. We're usually looking at somewhere between about 5.5 and 6.5 percent in terms of diagnosed diabetes, and then even higher, almost double in certain populations. Uh, so this low rate of diabetes automatically means that it will be more difficult to see a difference in 10 years. And then the other thing is that 10 years, believe it or not, when you're talking about a newly diagnosed patient, 10 years is not that long when we're talking about chronic complications of diabetes. So, you know, there, there are some problems with this study. Um, furthermore, it was uh, intention to screen, and even though they invited about 15 or 16,000 patients to be screened, only about 11,000 of them actually came and got screened. So it's not clear, based on the reading of the study, what happened to those other five or 6,000 people, uh, whether they had a higher rate of diabetes, lower rate of diabetes, or we, don't, we just don't know. And so um, there are some problems with this study. Uh, nevertheless, we wonder whether this kind of study can be applied to a place like Canada. We don't really know. Uh, and so that makes it difficult to interpret these kind of, these kind of results. So what is the case? By the way, I've added this slide, so if you're looking at slides, um, this is not on the one I gave you, but it's not a big deal. It's just an opinion. Um, the, when you're looking at the case for diabetes screening, I, I think if you're looking at cost savings uh, or potentially mortality, although we don't really know about mortality, because, so we can't really speak to it, um, I don't think you're going to find a good case. Uh, the type of study that would be required would be huge. I mean, it would be hundreds of thousands of people over 20 or 30 years. And, and that's a, those kind of studies are really difficult to do. Uh, so I, I don't know that we're going to see a great case in terms of cost savings. Um, conducting a definitive randomized trial um, is unfeasible for some of the reasons that I mentioned. But instead, we're left with a large number of studies with different designs. Um, and we infer that, and sometimes different results, of course, and we infer a reasonable approach to diabetes screening. So most of the people who work in this area feel that there is some benefit to screening, um, but exactly what the benefit is, we just can't prove it. Uh, so make of that what you will. Uh, we do recommend, by the way, that um, if you're going to screen, don't screen in an undifferentiated way. You screen in a uh, rational way, trying to identify high-risk patients in whom screening will really make a difference. So that gets us to how do we assess risk? Well, first of all, you have to know what the risk factors for diabetes are. And I think most of you probably know some of the risk factors, but we're going to go through them today. 
So if they have a first degree relative with type 2 diabetes, that significantly increases their risk. If they're a member of a so-called high risk population, and I, there's some, certain of them listed there, you can also include uh, Pacific Islander uh, in that group. Uh, history of pre-diabetes, of course, a history of gestational diabetes, or a history of macrosomic infants. Presence of associated problems, that is any evidence of micro or macrovascular disease, other vascular risk factors, that is elevated triglycerides or low HDL, the so-called metabolic syndrome, hypertension, obesity, uh, and increased abdominal circumference. For men, that's over 100, women over 88. Um, and associated diseases that are uh, linked to insulin resistance. So insulin resistance, of course, is one of the pathophysiologic hallmarks of type 2 diabetes. And these particular conditions are associated with insulin resistance. That is polycystic ovary syndrome, the presence of acanthosis. You guys are all familiar with acanthosis, right? So it's kind of that brownish velvety kind of texture that you see at the back of the neck or under the arms in people with insulin resistance. Sometimes if it's really bad, you can see it in the hands and around the knuckles. Uh, sleep apnea, psychiatric disorders. This is just not just any, atypical antipsychotics, but these are just people with psychiatric illness, that is major depression or schizophrenia, have a significantly increased risk of diabetes. Uh, HIV. Uh, and of course, certain drugs. And among the drugs, the biggest ones, of course, are steroids. I'm sure you guys know this, but if you put somebody at risk for diabetes on steroids, oftentimes you get super, super high uh, blood sugars, and it's related to peripheral insulin resistance. Atypical antipsychotic agents, uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy or others, and you know, there are a whole bunch of other medications, beta blockers and other things, hydrochlorothiazide, even statins, by the way, and that's a bit controversial, but uh, statins apparently do increase, in a small degree, increase the risk of, uh, of diabetes. So uh, what about assessing risk? Well, before you do any testing, you want to assess their risk. And, the, and in Canada, using the, uh, the DIACAN uh, study database that was, uh, that was studied back in 2001, they did develop this CAN risk assessment. And this is available. I think it's available mostly in pharmacies. I don't know if anybody uses it here. Um, but certainly, you could use it. You could have it in your waiting room. You can have patients fill it out. And the components, of course, are age, sex, BMI, waist circumference. We're going to actually go through it here. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on it. I was first I was going to get you guys all to, to, to fill it out yourselves, but I think that'll take too long. Um, it starts with age, uh, sex, um, BMI. And they can calculate their BMI, of course, based on their height and weight. Uh, and then waist circumference for men and women. And then uh, physical, level of physical activity. Uh, diet, kind of, do they eat fruits or vegetables? Um, do, have you had, do you have high blood pressure or other associated illnesses? Uh, have, you had, have you been told you had high blood sugar before? Have you given birth to a large baby? And do you have any uh, first degree relatives or blood relatives that have been diagnosed with diabetes? And, and then um, ethnicity and highest level of education. So this includes a socioeconomic component. There are the risk scores. If your risk is lower than 21, you're considered low, 21 to 32 moderate, and 33 and over high risk. For those people who are at high risk, we do recommend screening. Oh, by the way, there is this, which is a fin risk calculator. This is available online, too. Um, this was developed, of course, in Finland. Uh, may not be applicable to the Canadian population. Uh, it's, it's missing a few things that we do include. It doesn't include macrosomia or ethnicity, which, by the way, is very, very important uh, when you're thinking about risk stratification. Um, so that's available, but although I wouldn't, I don't think it's better than the can risk. I think it's probably not as appropriate. Once you decide whether you're going to actually do some testing, then this is the flow sheet that the CDA has developed. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> this looks like a bowl of spaghetti, so it's hard to um, Hard to know what to do in this situation, but, but I'll, I'll just qu quickly walk you through it. So for anyone over the age of 40 or considered high risk if they're under the age of 40, according to the risk calculator, it's recommended that you screen every three to five years. Now you screen, remember, with an A1C or fasting glucose. 
screen earlier or more frequently in people with additional risk factors. We talked about the risk factors. And then you get into this big algorithm. So we're going to quickly walk through it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but if you're fasting glucose and A1, fasting glucose less than 5.6, A1C less than 5.5, you're considered normal. Rescreen every three years, three to five years. If your fasting glucose is on repeated more than once, greater than seven, or an A1C greater than 6.5, greater than or equal to 6.5, you have diabetes. If your fasting glucose is between 5.6 and 6, or the A1C is between 5.5 and, and 6, but you have no additional risk factors, you would be considered at risk and maybe screen more often. If you have one or more risk factors, or your fasting glucose is between 6.1 and 6.9, or A1C between 6.0 and 6.4, it's recommended that you order a 75 oral a gram oral glucose tolerance test. And these are the results. So, <laughs> so just to try to break that down for you, this is basically normal, right? Fasting glucose less than 6.1, a two-hour OGTT value less than 7.8. This is impaired glucose tolerance, where you get the elevated fasting glucose, but the OGTT is normal. This is impaired, uh, sorry, impaired glucose tolerance is OGTT is elevated, sorry, fasting glucose is normal. This is impaired fasting glucose where your fasting glucose is elevated but OGTT is normal because there is a discrepancy. There's often a discrepancy between these two. And then this is where they're both abnormal. And if the A1C is between 6 and 6.4 percent or you have any of those, you are considered to have prediabetes and rescreen more often and, and usually we recommend a lifestyle therapy. So they could attend diabetes education classes, they could exercise, proper diet, et cetera. However, I've, I've written down just a few basic points that you can kind of take away from this, and hopefully it'll make sense. So if your A1C is less than 5.5 or fasting glucose less than 5.6, you're good. A1C between 5.6 and 5.9 or fasting glucose 5.6 to 6, you are at increased risk. You, you can consider doing an OGTT if you want to. You don't have to, but you can consider it. If an A1C is between 6 and 6.4 or a fasting glucose in that impaired range, you are considered to have prediabetes. They do recommend that you order an OGTT. I frankly think that it may not be all that important to order it, but it is recommended on the CDA guidelines because there are going to be some people with the OGTT who actually meet the criteria for diabetes. So it's possible that you're going to get some patients in this range who actually have diabetes and their A1C is below 6.5. If the A1C is greater than or equal to 6.5 in a stable diabetic, remember A1C is not recommended for people who are unstable or, people, or children, for instance, or people who could have type 1 diabetes because the glucose is changing rapidly. Or the fasting glucose is greater than 2 or an OGTT greater than 11.1, they have diabetes. Okay, now, after that confusing mess, something very, very simple. Do we screen for type 1 diabetes? The answer is no, we don't. And the reason we don't is because we don't have very good tests for screening for type 1 diabetes. We have some antibody tests that may predict long-term risk over a period of 10 or 25 years. We also don't have any interventions that we can realistically give that are going to prevent or delay the progression of type 1 diabetes. And so for this reason, we do not recommend screening for type 1 diabetes. So how much time do I have? About five minutes. OK. So I'm just going to run through all the recommendations. These are the recommendations as sort of quoted from the new CDA guidelines. All individuals should be evaluated annually for type 2 diabetes risk on the basis of demographic and clinical criteria. You'll notice the grade, right? Screening for diabetes using a fasting plasma glucose and A1C should be performed every three years in individuals greater than or equal to 40 years of age or at high risk using a risk calculator. Once again, notice the grade. Can you see the grade? I put it in small type. More frequent and or earlier testing with either a fasting glucose and or A1C or a two-hour uh, post 
OGTT, two-hour plasma glucose with a 75-gram OGTT, considered in those people who are at very high risk using a risk calculator or in people with additional risk factors. And there's uh, the risk factors that we went through before. I'm not going to go through them all again. Testing with two-hour plasma glucose in a 75 OGTT should be undertaken. Now, this is the recommendation that I kind of disagree with, but this is the recommendation nonetheless. Should be undertaken in people with a fasting glucose between 6.1 and 6.9 and an A1, or an A1C between 6 and 6.4 in order to identify people. Basically, you're differentiating people between IGT and diabetes. Testing with a two-hour OGTT may be undertaken in individuals with a fasting glucose between 5.6 and 6, or an A1C between 5.5 and 5.9, if they have one or more additional risk factors in order to identify individuals with IGT or diabetes. And there are the clinical guidelines, the new CDA guidelines available. By the way, the website um, for the guidelines, I really like. Um, they put a lot of effort into it, and I, it's very user-friendly. It's got slides, and believe it or not, it's got um, Alice Cheng, who is the editor. She's an endocrinologist in Mississauga. She, she reads out all the chapters. Like, you can actually just listen to it. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's a really fabulous uh, resource. Anyway, so, and there's a, there's a section for patients as well. So I'm sure this is all in your material. And I think that's about it for me, so I'm happy to take questions.